So uh, let us get rolling here because we've got some good stuff to talk about. So uh, welcome everybody that's joined us. Um, thank you for making the time to be with us today. I think we're going to have a great talk. Um, as you've probably already know, many of you, this is part of an ongoing series of uh, webinars we're going to be putting on to talk about um, design issues, uh, hopefully a little bit off the beaten path, deal with uh, challenges and solutions that are not often understood or talked about. So um, this session, I'll just let you know, is being recorded um, and there, the recording will be available um, after the webinar. Um, if I housekeeping matters, if I could just ask you to keep your uh, cameras off and your your mics muted during the session. And for questions, if I could ask you to try typing your questions that that come up in the chat, we'll try to answer them. Dean Michaud and I will try to answer them on the fly here while Wayne's talking and any that are still left at the end, we'll have a little Q&A session where Wayne can address them directly. Um, so I think that is about it. Um, without further ado, I will turn our session on hydrocarbon condensate stabilization over to Wayne Monnery. OK, great. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Dean, Carol Ann, uh, everybody else who's been involved in doing these webinars. Um, we're going to talk about stabilization today, hydrocarbon condensate stabilization in particular. Um, to many of you, uh, we, we did this internally and it was the same thing. To many of you, um, we're quite familiar with it. So we're going to try and talk about some of the things that maybe we're not as familiar with. So just bear with us. There are some review things that are uh, going to come up and then we're going to try and get into some of the new stuff. So come on, there we go. Outline of today's talk, so we go through some basics. What is stabilization, some specifications, then we talk about each of those vapor pressure C4 minus specifications, uh, contaminants like H2S removal. Anyway, how do we stabilize? And talking mostly about the tower system uh, because that's the more popular one, but we'll briefly just discuss that you can heat and flash. Um, what are some of the things that can go wrong? Troubleshooting, um, you can see a couple of them there. If we just plain don't make specifications. Uh, contaminants again, waxes, asphaltines, and salt, which seems to be uh, a new uh, kind of a new topic. All right, so let's start it off. What is stabilization? Um, as it says here, simply put, what we're trying to do is remove light components from liquid products. So liquid products is our uh, obviously our hydrocarbon condensate. What are we calling light components? Um, pretty much uh, C4 and minus, so it was a bit of a hint on the other slide. So um, all of those components we need out. Uh, stabilization is a generic term. Uh, what it really means is taking these light ends out of any liquid product so that we can, in fact, um, have them stable for storage and transportation. And the other issue is always who we're selling them to. There's going to be certain uh, specifications that we have to meet. Types of specifications. Um, well, first of all, these light components that we're talking about that we need to remove. How much do we have to remove? These days, the C4 minus spec is prevalent and C4 minus needs to be less than five volume percent. And there you can see the definition of C4 minus and it's a little bit different than it used to be. Um, we didn't used to have the three times out in front of the uh, C1 plus C2 plus C3. What we used to state was just uh, uh, that uh, the C4 content should be less than five volume percent. And does this really make a difference? It actually does. It's the propane that's a bit of a sticking point here. And uh, so three times that amount plus your butanes can sometimes uh, make it more stringent than it used to be. We usually uh, find it pretty easy to get rid of the methane and ethane. So uh, they're not really the issue. It's the three times propane. We still often have vapor pressure specifications to meet, in this case, RVP. And we had quite a discussion in the last webinar about RVP versus TVP and RVP being read vapor pressure, which is an ASTM procedure for measurement of a vapor pressure type out in the field. 
TVP being true vapor pressure uh, based on thermodynamics, that is the pressure above which I won't have vapor or below which I will. Um, and I don't want to go into it too much, but uh, typically for RVP, uh, we need to meet something like 83 to 100 kPa. These are absolute units. So um, I've had one person who thought they were gauged. They are not gauged. So in fact, uh, we're, when we're below about 100, 101 kPa, yes, we are getting into a vacuum and that's on purpose. Contaminants, uh, there are several um, different specifications we can have to meet. One of the major ones for us is to get the H2S less than 20 ppm by weight or mass. Temperature, we usually have to meet a temperature specification of 40 to 50 C, it depends. Um, I will direct you to see the Pembina low vapor pressure specifications um, because there are uh, an array of other ones that I'm not really gonna go into, um, but minor specifications um, relating to different types of components uh, that can contaminate, as well as uh, some corrosion specifications. So how do we stabilize? Um, we mentioned this on the outline slide, heating and flashing, or some kind of stabilizer tower system. So stabilizing, um, or doing it rather through heating and flashing, uh, is involving just heating up our uh, wild condensate, so that is the condensate then with the light ends in it. We're going to heat it up, then we're going to put it through a flash drum and we're going to flash the gas off there. And then we're going to potentially do it again by heating it a little further, dropping it in pressure and then putting it through uh, another flash drum. So how often do we do this? Um, sort of depends on the pressure and uh, it's almost the reverse of compression when you think of sort of a ratio of three between stages, we often take a ratio of three here um, when we're dropping the pressure. So for example, if you were coming in at uh, 699 kPa or 100 PSIG, what we might do is run the first flash stage at 100, then a factor of three below that. So we might run the second one at uh, what is 30 PSIG or just over 200 kPa. And then the third stage would probably be just uh, um, tank pressure. So um, yeah, that's a pretty simple thing to do. Um, it's not that uh, costly. It's, it is simple. The problem with it is, or the challenge is that we often can't meet our specifications by just simply um, heating, dropping pressure and flashing. So we resort to the second of the two methods, the stabilizer tower system. The other thing about this is if you're not careful how you flash, you can actually result, uh, or it can result rather with, uh, in less liquid product. So stabilizer tower system um, involves, at the heart of it, a multi-stage fractionation tower, but it has lots of other equipment that go with it. You can see a bit of a list here. As you come in with your liquid coming from the inlet separator, you're gonna go through some kind of uh, preheat, which is a feed bottom exchanger most often. There'll be then a flash drum or a feed drum. Uh, after that, it the liquid, um, well, you're separating then vapor from your two liquid phases and your desired liquid, the raw condensate is actually then going over to the tower. So it's gonna drop a little more in pressure and go into the tower. The tower itself uh, is obviously part of the system. Along with that, there's a reboiler. And then we have also a product cooler. And there are different uh, versions of this, different schemes that we're going to talk about today. So yes, this option usually has upstream heating and separation. And we say usually, not always. But it's it's usually those, those inlet pieces of equipment followed by the tower. And then you're just cooling the liquid off to meet the specification. Um, as we mentioned earlier, this preheat is a feed bottoms exchanger most often, and um, we're, we're heating up to actually take load off the reboiler, but um, we don't want to overheat. The tower overhead is a vapor, and then we're usually taking that vapor, and it's going to be sent for further processing somewhere, like if we're on the front end of a gas plant, um, we're going to send it to the gas plant, and likely we're going to need some compression, so um, it'll either go back into the front or, or whatever stage it can get into, 
um, in the main compression for the gas plant, or it may need uh, a compressor all on its own, a dedicated compressor. And uh, sometimes there is no gas plant. We're actually just doing some field stabilization, and then we're sending our vapor uh, back into a, a gas pipeline of sorts. So there it would need a dedicated compressor. The tower itself has an operating profile, and um, most of you probably know this, but for those who don't, um, as we go down the tower, it's going up in temperature and it's going up in pressure. There's not a huge change in pressure. Um, you know, we're looking at maybe three uh, PSI, 20 kPa roughly, uh, perhaps a little higher, but it's not, it's not a large change in pressure. The temperature change, though, is usually quite a bit higher. And uh, you can see there the actual tower pressures of about 240 to 1,034 kPa gauge, or in old units, about 35 to 150 PSI. So it's somewhere in there. Quite often, we're, uh, we take some middle ground, and we're usually about 350 kPa or 50 PSIG. Now, the bottom's temperature, which uh, uh, if I go back to the second bullet for a moment, that's what we're really doing, is we're putting heat into the system. And so we're stabilizing this liquid by boiling those light ends out the top. The temperature required to do this, uh, quite often around 135 to 170 degrees C. That's gonna, it's a big range, but it's based on whatever pressure you pick, as well as the composition of the, uh, condensate itself. Now, the interesting thing about this, and as Mark brought up, we're going to try and take uh, maybe uh, a path less traveled, um, is that we can sometimes, not all the time, but sometimes actually get a stabilized condensate with a much lower temperature. So how do we do that? Uh, to be discussed in a few slides. So we'll circle back to it, and we're going to discuss how you might do that. So these heavier components, then they flow down the tower. They're staying in the liquid phase. Um, after we get to the bottom and the lighter components are boiled up, so they're coming back up the tower as a vapor phase. And a stabilizing tower system is several stages where you've got this intimate contact of liquid and vapor happening. H2S as a contaminant has a similar volatility. That means, you know, uh, it's its boilability, if you will, or how easily it can boil. It's similar to ethane, so it'll definitely come out of the top end of the tower. Different configurations, I mentioned that. So the first one is we can have a mid-fed configuration. And if we're mid-fed, this is your typical distillation type tower equipped with a reboiler on the bottom. On the top, we're going to have a reflux system. So that means our vapor is going to come out. We're going to condense a portion of that uh, vapor to liquid. It goes into a reflux drum, and that liquid is pumped back into the tower. Uh, reflux is a terminology, for those of you who don't know, it's a terminology we use to just uh, send liquid back into the tower, and it results in, again, more liquid going down that tower that might have been lost to the overhead. And because we're kind of recycling some of the liquid back around, we get better separation. That's not nearly as popular as the top fed configuration for a condensate stabilizer. And this is where we, as the name implies, we've got feed to the top of the tower and we have no uh, reflux. So this is just fed, the vapor flashes out of the top, the liquid goes down, and then still contacts with the vapor coming up from the reboiler. Then there's something else called a split fed configuration at, that some of our vendors have been proposing to us uh, in the, of sort of the last, I want to say, 10 years or so. And this is where we're trying to get the best of both worlds in a way. Um, we take the liquid feed to the tower and we split it. And the liquid part of that is going to go to the very top of the tower and it's going to maybe act as a bit of reflux. And then we, the other split, we heat even more and then put it sort of to the mid-fed part of the tower. And it's a mixed phase, so there's vapor and liquid there. And we're trying to get the best of both worlds there. I mentioned this before, preheating, um, which is common to all of these configurations. Um, it re reduces the reboiler duty required. 
um, but not the temperature, meaning that you can reduce the, the reboiler duty itself, how many BTUs an hour or kilowatts you need, but that's not going to change the temperature at which, uh, or the temperature which is required to meet the specifications. Now, we can get carried away with this. Uh, I mentioned not to overheat before. Uh, what we're talking about there is if you get carried away on reducing the reboil duty and you heat the daylights out of this stuff, you can start to send your C5 plus product overhead. So we're looking for a bit of a compromise here to not overheat, but to then, of course, substantially reduce the reboil duty. So here's just a little schematic showing what I just explained. This one happens to be the mid fed, but it doesn't matter. It'll suffice for uh, um, it won't it won't suffice for the reflux system, um, but it'll suffice for the other two, which are more popular. So if you start from the left, you can see the feed comes in. We go through the first feed bottoms exchanger. We then go through the feed drum, uh, that flash we talked about, and it's going to separate the overhead vapor. You can see that coming off the top from the desired liquid, which is coming off the middle, and then there's water coming off the bottom. If I were a top fed, that second exchanger that says feed bottom exchanger to there, that wouldn't exist. And the pathway then would just be following that. Uh, I'm going to actually see if I can get. Uh, no, I can't. Um, I was going to see if I could get the laser pointer working, but. Um, anyway, you would follow uh, the top split of those two. So if it was top fed, second exchanger doesn't exist. You follow the top part of the split, and that would be your top fed configuration. In the split fed configuration, you do indeed split it. The top fed part goes to the top. It's liquid, as we mentioned. The other split goes through further heat exchange so that you get that mixed phase, and it goes to the, about the middle of the tower. The tower is indicated as packed, but it can be packed or trayed. You then uh, see that the vapor comes off the bottom of the tower. It meets up with the vapor from the feed drum, and they're going to go wherever that further processing I mentioned earlier happens to be. The bottom liquid coming off the reboiler, which now meets specifications, goes back through one or two exchangers, depending on the configuration, and then through a product cooler, and we have uh, then a product condensate that can go to sales. What's happening inside this tower? Well, I mentioned it could be trays or packing, and I don't really want Fractionation 101, I got a little long-winded internal presentation that we did, so I'm going to make it a little shorter this time, but um, going from left to right on this slide, what you're seeing there is how trays operate. They're called cross-flow trays, and so liquid just goes down sort of along the side of the tower through a downcomer across the tray and then over a weir into another downcomer, and this continues on through all the trays. Um, where's the vapor in that diagram? Well, it's generally coming up through um, perforations of some kind in the trays, and that's kind of the middle part of the diagram, and you can see there are different trays. Um, we, a long time ago, used to use sieve trays, uh, tried bubble caps a little bit. We've sort of settled on valve trays, which are the bottom part of the middle diagram, and so that's just your vapor coming up through the perforation, through the valve, and then it bubbles through the liquid. And that's what gets us our contact. That's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it is to put some kind of packing in there. And packing works considerably differently. We basically put liquid through a distributor at the top. It rains down through the tower and it wets the packing. Um, the two types of packing, you can have a random or dumped packing as well as structured. Either way, it works the same way. The packing gets wet with the liquid that's raining down through the tower provides a lot of surface area for the vapor that's rising, and they meet at the surface uh, of the packing. In either way, um, you basically get, get intimate contact between liquid and vapor phases. So when we simulate these units, which is typically how we do all the calculations, of course, we set the specification in the tower bottom liquid to meet whatever required specification or specifications uh, that we need. And this usually involves this bottom tower temperature. Um, if we think of the RVP specifications and the C4 minus, uh, 
this temperature range came up before about 135 to 170 C at 350 kPa, which I said was the middle ground there. And um, where it actually lands at this pressure will depend on the composition. If you have a heavier condensate, it's going to require a higher temperature. The other thing that you're not going to realize is if your condensate is more dead, in other words, let's say um, you were taking feed from some tankage across the street, like somebody else has been collecting condensate and then they send it over to you, but it's been sitting for days or maybe a week out there, it will be more dead than condensate um, that's coming straight off the process to you, um, just through a feed drum or like inlet separator to feed drum into the tower. And it's not a well-known fact, but when you have much deader condensate, you will also have to go to a higher temperature. And that's because from weathering in the tank, you've lost some light ends. And that is the stuff that constitutes your kind of stripping gas, which is what your reboiler makes for you. So if, if it's more dead, your reboiler has to make that up. It means it has to go to a higher temperature. Now, we talked about this before, and it said TBD. Sometimes we can make RVP sales specification at a much lower tower bottom temperature. Uh, like what? Like maybe around 100 degrees C. So how is that happening when I just said it needs to be 135 to 170? Well, um, we're kind of combining, if you will, the tower uh, system with almost the heating flashing system because what we're doing is we're getting part of the way there during the tower and then we cool it off a little bit um, through the feed bottoms exchanger on the way back and then uh, through our aerial cooler but it reaches the storage tank and it flashes so it's like having another stage of separation and now if you analyze the liquid from your store your storage uh, tower that you can actually find that it makes RVP spec or C4 minus, yet you didn't appear to make it from the tower bottom. So it's that extra stage that your storage tank is actually acting as. Does that always happen? It doesn't. Um, I'm just saying it can. So if you run into this where especially, you know, analyzing an existing unit where somebody says, hey man, like there's no way we, ha we have to heat to 135 or 140 or something that you say we do, we're nowhere near that and we do make spec condensate that's likely what's going on now is there a disadvantage to doing this not necessarily a disadvantage but you have to be prepared for the fact that if you're going to use your storage tank as a final flash vessel you will have considerable vapor coming off there and of course then uh, your vru will have to handle that because there's no way you're going to be able to vent that so path less traveled sometimes that happens and if it does that's what's going on when we simulate again we're using equilibrium stages or ideal stages and we can typically make a stable condensate with five to ten of these equilibrium or ideal stages how does that compare to actual stages when we're out in the field well actual stages are equilibrium divided by the stage efficiency for trays and that's a number that you can look up, but a number like 50% wouldn't be unreasonable, meaning then that my equilibrium stages, if I took 10, for example, to get where I needed to go, it's double. It's 10 divided by 50% or 0.5, so that would be double. If I happen to have a packed column, I need to look up a number called a height equivalent of a theoretical plate, or HETP, and then I'm going to take the number of equilibrium stages and multiply it by this HETP number. So it'll be a number of feet per stage. And on the outside, as kind of a maximum, you could probably count on a number like around three feet. Um, it's probably less than that, but I'm just saying if you want in a worst case scenario and you want to remember one number, three feet's not a bad number. Okay. So I just covered these bullets. Uh, if you want to quickly read them, you can, but we just talked about um, equilibrium stages and uh, divide by the uh, stage efficiency for trays to get real stages or multiply by the height equivalent per plate um, for packing. And again, these are lookup numbers. Uh, you can get them 
in some generic sources like the uh, GPSA data books, or better yet, get your vendors like Coke Glitch and Salser, Common Tower Internals vendors, get them to give them to you. So the first step in any troubleshooting is this, of course, simulation that we've been talking about. So we want to develop a valid simulation model. Uh, what do I mean by a valid or in, I need to validate it? What does that mean? That means that um, in troubleshooting, I'm dealing with an existing system and I can't just randomly simulate it and assume everything's right. I want to actually match plant data, okay? So make sure it matches plant data. Like I'm able to, for example, get the right bottoms composition, uh, overhead composition, if that's available to me, the temperature profile should be correct at the given pressures, that sort of thing. So that's step number one. Um, if we don't make liquid product specifications, what's happening, we typically are not hot enough at the bottom. That's really what's going on. Now, why might that be? Well, we might have insufficient reboiler capacity. So in other words, the reboiler was designed for less flow, different composition, maybe a different pressure. So that's kind of preempting the next bullet. There's a reason why we don't have sufficient reboiler capacity. Um, when we talk about capacity, not necessarily the duty, although that is an indicator, but really we're going to end up looking at the surface area of that reboiler. So we want to check the duty for sure. Um, we want to check the surface area and we're going to get that from a data sheet. So we're going to have to date that up from uh, the people who supplied that for us. One of the other things though that gets less checked and we need to have a look at is the heat medium system itself. Make sure that the heat medium coming to the reboiler is in fact at the supply and return temperatures that we think it's supposed to be at. Otherwise our analysis isn't correct. If I know the supply and return temperatures of the heat medium as well as its flow, I can really have a careful look at this exchanger and I can calculate things like the UA value because the UA value is just the duty over that mean temperature difference. And if I know that U times A value, then I can go on the data sheet and get A. And if I divide one by the other, I can actually get U, otherwise known as the overall heat transfer coefficient or OHTC, which you can see in the next bullet. Now, why do I care about looking at that? Well, surface area is fixed for me, so that's the sort of capacity we're looking at. So what we want to find out, though, is how this exchanger is performing compared to how it was designed to perform. So what we're really going to do is we're going to look at that overall heat transfer coefficient or U value and compare it to the data sheet. Now, admittedly, it will be a bit different if we're at a different flow, but uh, if it's a lot different, for example, much, much lower, than what the data sheet says it should be, then we're probably looking at fouling with what kinds of stuff? Waxes, asphaltines, and salt. They are very common um, fouling agents. If the reboiler bundle was leaking, um, which is an, something that we've seen from uh, clients recently, it's likely salt corrosion. Uh, that seems to be very common in the Montney area now. So how do we get, <clears throat> excuse me, how are we getting salt into the reboiler? Well, uh, these wax condensates, which are coming from the Montney, in combination with very, very high milligram per liter or PPM salt water that's coming out of the Montney zone, um, they're kind of combining. So it's wax and salt water. And basically, First of all, coming even through the system over to the stabilizing tower, we can foul up things along the way, like feed coalescers, for example. We've run into this lots. And what they're finding isn't so much salt, but wax. So in order to basically keep the system uh, from doing that and fouling off, we want to keep that whole inlet feed system above the wax appearance temperature, or WAT. Okay, sometimes called the cloud point. So you want to keep it above that. How do you know what that number is? Um, it's not that easy to calculate accurately. Um, simulators don't do a really great job of it. Uh, lab data is your best bet to find out. 
Now, let's say we succeed in doing that. We make our way over to the feed drum. We haven't we haven't plugged anything off. Um, we now are trying to separate the vapor liquid uh, and well and two liquids. So vapor, water, and our condensate. Now, what it is wax exactly? Well, wax, as it turns out, is part of condensate. It's sort of the probably uh, roughly speaking, the in the low twenties in carbon number, like say C twenty plus C twenty four plus somewhere in there. So it is maybe not the majority of the condensate, but it's always there naturally anyway, um, as the heavier end of the condensate. So with these high or very waxy condensates that are coming out of the Montney zone now, we're getting, I guess, a, a higher amount of that. Um, those upper carbon numbers and so we get a waxy condensate and the interesting thing about this is that this wax which um, doesn't have a large solubility number for water okay so we wouldn't expect a lot of water to be in the wax due to straight solubility it's the same old thing oil and water don't mix right um, neither, neither does wax and water particularly but wax can form this solid layer and when it forms a solid layer it seems to be carrying the salt water over into um, the tower system and so what's happening is we are getting some wax forming even though we're trying not to do that we're getting some forming and there's a particular layer it might look like a rag layer that's in the feed drum and if it goes over the weir and into the feed part it's going to go into the tower. Of course, when it does that, it goes down the tower, experiences the reboil temperature. It will turn that wax back into liquid condensate. And when that happens, the water is released. Quite often, you could see from the kinds of temperatures that we have that that's enough to boil at least part, if not all, the water up in the tower. What does that leave? It leaves you with salt on the bottom. This particular salt can sit and coat the reboiler, and we have a beautiful picture from one of our clients that's going to remain nameless. But there you can see the caked on salt deposits of a reboiler from this very mechanism. If you ask me, how do I know that that's the mechanism? We actually, uh, from that same client, some lab studies were done, and they actually showed like they took, they let wax form in the lab. They actually took the wax out of one container, put it into another then put some fresh water in there, then measured the salt content of the fresh water after a while, and lo and behold, there was salt in the water, meaning that the wax actually was holding some salt. So um, the operator of that particular facility called them hydrated uh, waxes, and that was what he said was carrying the salt, and he was bang on. So this salt can end up in the reboiler, um, and the salt, it's being carried by the salt water, the water's boiled off, and we get these salt deposits. And if they're severe, um, not only plugging, but we can actually experience corrosion, and then we get pinhole leaks in the tube bundle. Many companies, it turns out, actually have experienced this, and um, uh, they've proposed various solutions. Um, and here, here are some of the solutions that, um, when I went out and spoke to some of these companies, these are some of the things they've been doing. One company told me that, you know, you got to start thinking of this more like an oil battery and that your feed drum should be regarded as a desalting vessel. What does that really mean? It means we want to run it hot. We want to have a long retention time and we want to be adding fresh water upstream with potential chemicals that we would normally add into an oil battery like emulsion breakers and wax dispersants. Some of the other solutions uh, that people have come up with is adding fresh water to the tower bottom or near the tower bottom. And it tends to dilute the salt water that's going to the reboiler. And so let's dilute it. And then in fact, let's put a water boot or a separator in the piping between the tower bottom and the reboiler and take as much of that water out as we can. Uh, another one is a continuous slipstream. It's a recycle from the reboiler. Uh, one of the bottom nozzles, uh, even better if it's a boot. And then it's the small slipstream recycle going back to the feed drum. What does that do? 
Well, if it turns out that you have a kettle type reboiler, that's just helping you um, move a little more liquid because they tend to be on the process side, which is of course uh, the kettle side, it tends to be a bit stagnant, which then uh, tends to, to uh, make the deposit of salt worse. So if we can move the fluid a little more, we're not gonna necessarily cure the problem, but it might make, make, it, make it a little bit better. Evidence suggests uh, that lower temperature results in softer deposits. We actually saw some of this as well in that uh, at lower temperatures, um, the salt deposits were able to be washed off with water and people running higher reboiler temperatures were actually having to, to wash um, with a mild acid to get it off. Water actually wasn't taking it off. So how do you get a lower reboiler temperature? Well, um, we talked about it uh, uh, earlier that you could do it by accident if you were using your storage tank uh, as a final flash stage. But um, there are ways we can do it on purpose uh, if we have this salt problem. We could run the tower at lower pressure. Um, if you recall, we talked about uh, the tower pressure and temperature uh, increase as you go down the tower. So if I were to run the bottom of the tower at a lower pressure, I would have a lower temperature required to meet the spec. So that's one possibility. The other possibility is using external stripping gas like sales gas and using that to help you strip. That means your reboiler doesn't have to work as hard and you're gonna end up being able to run at a lower temperature. Um, reboiler design itself might help you um, with this. Um, in the same way we talked about the uh, having the continuous slipstream recycle creating more movement, maybe we should actually not use a kettle type reboiler. Um, we could use, for example, a thermosiphon type reboiler, which uh, has much more movement, of course, because the process fluid now goes through the tube side. So we wouldn't get as much deposition there. Um, there's even a line heater style of reboiler where uh, it's not multi uh, necessarily uh, a multi tube design some of them are some of them are some of them aren't but that's where basically we have a, a, a line heater style where it's an indirect fired unit it's just got glycol sitting at a hot temperature and we run through uh, some kind of tube or tubes um, but it's still it the key is it's running through those tubes it's not stagnant this is another uh, schematic which just basically shows you what I was just talking about. So if I start from the upper left in the feed and we were talking about making the feed drum into a desalting drum. So you can see there that's where we would add fresh water that would be upstream of our feed bottoms exchanger and we add the appropriate chemicals there go through the feed bottoms exchanger. Uh, we want to be able to get to 50 to 60 degrees C and remember if we're adding water after the fact this exchanger may not be big enough so that might be something that we definitely have to check how much fresh water do you have to add oh likely around five percent or so uh, of the uh, feed charge of condensate um, so add that with our chemicals into a drum 50 to 60 degrees c it does probably doesn't have to be much hotter than that um, we want, though, to have at least 20 minutes, 20 to 30 minutes of retention time in here. And also, we want to make sure we have the ability to remove this wax layer, which I referred to earlier as a potential rag layer. So you want to be able to suck that out from time, excuse me, from time to time. Where else can we add water, uh, fresh water, that is? Well, the one I mentioned was coming off the tower bottom, and you can see there that uh, if we added water in to the tower bottom there somewhere, it would come off. We said it would dilute the salt water coming off the bottom. And there I'm showing you that I could put a drum there or a water boot, and that's between the bottom and the reboiler. So that was another one. This diagram also shows um, the slipstream recycle that's actually going back to the feed drum. Okay, so there are many ways we can do it. Um, people have added water in other places as well, but the key is adding fresh water to dilute the salt water. Well, what else can we experience aside from salt? We've had uh, uh, 
a conversation about that. Uh, just um, if we weren't, we talked about not making uh, specifications, things like that, or what about just plain old capacity uh, of the system? So we need to be able to check uh, capacity of the other parts of the system, like the tower internals, as well as the ancillary equipment. We would check the tower internals using vendor software. That's the most common way to do it today. I mentioned two of the main vendors. They each produce software and that enables us to do that. Um, we would also want to check the feed product exchanger. I said especially if we were deciding to add water, but even under normal circumstances. And same thing as the reboiler. If that overall heat transfer coefficient or U value seems low compared to what it should be, we could be fouled up with some of these items. We'd want to be able to check the feed drum vapor velocity and the liquid retention time and make sure we have enough capacity in there. Um, one thing I didn't mention too much already, I alluded to it a little bit, but um, we may need an overhead compressor, a dedicated overhead compressor in the system. And if we do, we want to also be able to check uh, its flow at whatever the suction pressure is and the power required. Okay, so that kind of takes you through uh, um, some of the path less traveled, particularly around um, weird stuff, maybe uh, in your reboiler that you can seem to be able to stabilize when you shouldn't be, uh, a large discussion on salt, and then just uh, ending off there with make sure and uh, check all of your components uh, for capacity and make sure that uh, you got enough capacity in your system. And I'll leave it there and open the floor to questions.